Hello, and welcome to the Cleveland Stater Podcast. My name is Dan Menigan, and I am the editor-in-chief of the Cleveland Stater, a laboratory newspaper at Cleveland State University. The idea of this podcast is to have a discussion with members of the faculty and students about not only what is happening on the campus of Cleveland State, but around the world. Some episodes will be about serious issues, and others will be a little more lighthearted. This week, we sat down with Dr. Richard Perloff. Dr. Perloff has written books and articles on political communication that have received national recognition and teaches the subject here at Cleveland State. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So the third debate came to an end on Wednesday night. There are no more debates. We're done. What, what are your takeaways from this? Well, I think that, I think that Trump really showed his anti-democratic spirit. I've tried over the, over the course of the semester with my political communication students to look at both sides of Trump. And, and certainly there's some positives he's engaged. He's, adult, he's contributed to the campaign as far as trade. And we can go back and forth. The sexual assault, there's nothing positive about that in any world. But when you say, and, I, and, Chris, and, and uh, Chris Wallace was, was great, uh, kudos across the board for him. When you're asked if you're going to accept a democratic outcome uh, of an election and you say you're not going to or you're going to have to think about it or you use a reality TV show uh, uh, bait, well, I'll, I'll leave you in suspense. That's not a norm of democracy. Democracy from Washington on was based in America on the idea, on the idea that we will exchange power between different groups peaceably. We can disagree, partisanship, we can have negative advertising, but, but to raise the specter of that is, is thoroughly uh, degrading to democracy. There are other aspects of the debate we can talk about, and they're more nuanced, and there's good, they're bad. But that, I think, was the thing that really was a, a takeaway. Well, and that's the scariest thing, at least to me, that has come out of this entire Trump thing to begin with, is, I mean, it's borderline revolutionary what he's doing and I'm not saying that in a way of breaking ground I'm saying that in a way of pitchforks and torches right you know more than anything and it's just holy smokes I mean it is I feel like Donald Trump and, and correct me if I'm wrong here but I feel like Donald Trump has almost tapped into you know the the Freudian idea of the id the ego and the super ego and I feel like Donald Trump has just tapped into the id in all of us or, or at least his supporters in that way of basically just like, I disagree with what you're saying, I hold the biggest stick, now shut up and leave me alone. Well, I like the metaphor. I mean, I think, I think that, and I like the accessing of the id, and I think that it, there's a little more to it. And I like the pitchfork aspect, because certainly we talk about pitchfork populism, and certainly there is that. I, I think he's tapping into a lot of actually... It isn't only it being irrational and affective. I think he's t t he's tapping into a lot of stereotype beliefs and a lot of anger out there. Some of the anger is 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 based on uh, economic marginalization, trade, people who who are having lives where they're where they're dependent on opioids, where things haven't worked out. And we understand that, but when it starts to be where you're just going to say, hey. It's, it's, he's tapping, and I think you're, in a general way, you're right. When you're talking about conspiracy theories, and we've seen that from groups before, well, you know, the Obama, Obama, oh my gosh, there's a conspiracy. The, the, the media are not covering Obama. I mean, he really was a, a Muslim, or he really, was, he really wasn't born here. He's tapped into some of these conspiracy theories, and they've been dormant. Now, some of that, what he's tapped into is good in the sense that he's giving people a voice, and that's good. Where, where he starts, to, where the crowd, a la the French Revolution, from what I know, starts to be greater than him, and they start to do things that are over his, his control. I mean, Gore actually told his people to stop after he conceded in 2000. And he had, he, that, I think, is a problem. I mean, I think, I think we have a phenomenon, I think you put your finger on it in terms of populism. We have a phenomenon where, and I looked at populism. Populism is not all good. We've had some populism, if you go into the 1892 era, when it actually kind of developed, when William Jennings Bryant was, became the candidate. He was a populist, and he ran, actually, in 96 on the Democratic ticket. But populism has some very, very positive roots where people have been taken advantage of, where, where it's very anti-elite and people have been taken advantage of by the powers that be, and they're, they're rising up. But also, it has very, very uh, prejudiced, racist, uh, anti-Semitic, negative aspects. If you look at, the, if you look at uh, some of the, the Huey Long, if you look at George Wallace, you can certainly 
look at there, there are aspects of that. And so that's that's the darker side of what Trump has done. As far as the third debate, I think the third debate was in some ways very, very good. I always like to look at the positive because so many people look at the negative. It you you don't you had Hillary Clinton going out and saying uh, when you're talking about ripping a baby out of a uh, out of a, uh, a womb, Donald, that's not true. And by the way, doctors say that his statement of that was not what partial birth or any kind of abortion is, so that was inaccurate. But but she was defending choice, and I and, and she was defending choice. And I'm not arguing that choice is something to be defended. What I'm saying is is that by watching the debate you could then see that was her position. And that informs people. And you've got some dialogue, somewhat uh, mediocre and primitive, but at least it was a dialogue on the Second Amendment. And she explained she was not against the Second Amendment. And if, and if you're a pro-Second Amendment person, you may not agree with that, but that's good. Uh, and you also heard her taking a very muscular stand on Russia. All, all very good. So that's all very positive of the debate. I think as far as other aspects of the debate, it got very negative. And, they, and so a reporter from Time Magazine was trying to track me down yesterday saying, was this the first time they never shook hands? I, I don't know, but it was one of the first times they had not shaken hands. And then, of course, in the Al Smith thing, where they, it, was, it, was, it was kind of poor humor compared to Obama and Romney, who were very funny. But uh, I think we saw some of that in our class. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that, you know, she's talking about reading the Statue of Liberty a four or a five, you know, fairly mediocre jokes. But there was, there was a lot of tension, of course. Uh, but at least there they tried to shake hands. So, so the debate was positive, but I think for most Americans, it was very, very discouraging. One of my students said you couldn't even watch it. Uh, that's maybe a statement about her, but it's also a statement about the fact, and that's fine, people have entitled to their views. But I think it's also a statement that the campaign has gotten very searing and very, very tawdry. It very much is. I mean, it definitely feels more, I mean, very much two opposite sides to, you know, Elf was just butting heads against each other constantly and constantly, and you know it. It's more or less, and I mean, I know you've you've taught this so well. I mean, if this doesn't feel like a boxing match, I give up because it really is almost like it's just you know, Trump continues to just jab and jab and jab and then try to go for haymakers every so often as Hillary tends to jab back, and I feel like Trump's biggest haymaker is the one that's just not landing. And it's this email thing that is, it almost feels like it's starting to just get kind of like, oh yeah, by the way, and she's got this email, and he keeps hammering it, and I feel like the general public is like, yes, so it's gone through FBI, it's gone through all of these different places, yes, what she did, was it probably wrong? Eh, yeah, it was a little shady, it was a little sketchy, but we found it overall to be illegal, or, or legal, I should say, my apologies. You know, and I feel like he continues to hit this, and hit this, and hit this, and his... You know, his voters in that stuff are turning around and, or I shouldn't say his voters, but the undecided voters are instead turning around and just going like, and your point is. I think that's probably true. I think that's probably true of the undecideds. The complicating point here is that there continues to be negative information. It's just, it's just a gift uh, of, of negative information that keeps on giving. Now there's new information from WikiLeaks about how she said... That when you're in, that when you have to say one thing in public and another thing in private, which is a thing of stand, any any politician would say that, but it doesn't. You don't want people to have heard it. She then said that she was. That then she made the statement that 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 was very very favorable to the TPP in Wall Street and Wall Street. And then the most recent information about how she is now has aides who were affiliated with her campaign and were trying to rabble, rabble rouse and make trouble and get the so so called fraudulent voters to vote. I mean, that's that's negative. It's very bad. I mean, it, go, it goes back to, to some of the earliest dirty tricks where where people would, would stand at, uh, it even goes back to, I think it was where in, in the 72 campaign, people would have signs saying, McGovern is this, McGovern is that, or, <laughs> or actually actually one of my heroes, Bobby Kennedy, who did this in the 1960 campaign, saying that, you know, that Hubert Humphrey uh, hates, hates uh, Catholics. So these kinds of things go way back, and the Clinton campaign is to be criticized for that, absolutely. And negative campaigning of this sort is, is, goes way back. What we're seeing in this campaign is just a, a funnel, and a, a, just a continuing gushing of negativity. And I don't, I mean, you, the, the, the sum total of that is, is that people, I think, are turned off. The candidates, she's doing it a lot. 
She's not running a particularly positive campaign. In fact, in fact, to be fair, if you look at the advertising, of course, she's doing much, much more advertising than Trump anyway, so it's not even close. He's not even advertising. And by the way, there's actually evidence that suggests that his lack of advertising may be hurting him. But if you look at the advertising, she is being doing much more negative advertising than he is. Her ads with the kids looking in, you know, shocked and very, very hurt when Trump makes these very... You know, these, these very terrible comments about women. All that, I think, is somewhat effective, and it's a very negative campaign. It's probably somewhat effective, and there's a balance sheet about what is good and what is bad, but normatively, you can't say that the campaign has really done much to, uh, to advance. The, I mean, there, afterwards, there are going to be so many issues, climate control, uh, issues that are going on in the cities that will not have been touched in this campaign. What do you think that's due to that they're not touching on it? Is it the fact that Trump has never really addressed the plan? Is it the fact that it just has become dwarfed by everything else that was taking place? What do you think is causing us not to hit these main issues? That's a very good question. I think I've thought about that. I think, first of all, they're two very unpopular candidates. So they're both very negative. So if they're both negative, then then, then, then the only way you're good, then people are saying, well, I don't like him anyway, this person, I don't like that person. Uh, they're the... The only way that they can they can make ground is by put it, pointing out the negatives and the others because people feel already so negative to them. The other is that it's kind of a, a, a it's become kind of a nuclear war. He says something very terrible about her, and he goes for the jugular, and then she finds and 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 this by the way has been her modus operandi as a candidate since the for for almost forever. She finds that it's very effective to go very negative. She has been much more effective in going negative on him than proposing policies. And she finds that's a good way that there probably are more pro-Clinton voters to be gotten by, by criticizing Donald Trump than by giving them positive reasons to vote for Hillary Clinton. Now, she did that in the last debate. She was effective on abortion and choice, and you may agree or disagree with that, and that's fine. But at least she did articulate that, reasons to vote for her that were positive. I think it comes down to strategy, Dan. There's four reasons you can vote. You can vote for candidate A. You can vote against candidate A. You can vote for candidate B. You can vote against candidate B. And if you look at that, they're giving primarily reasons to vote against them. Now, in, vote against their opponent. Now, in the primaries, actually, it was very different. The primaries were, by contrast, very positive. And didn't seem that way. I mean, the days of, of the attacks on Ted Cruz's wife, which were terrible, and, 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 the, and, the, and the idea that Ted Cruz's father was working for, uh, well, you know, trying to assassinate yeah. you know, Lee Harvey. Uh, John, working with Lee Harvey with John F. Kennedy, yeah. But, but actually, Trump was actually very issued. Now, some of the Muslim stuff, one can say, is prejudiced, and, and I think some of it was, but he was talking about issues. He was talking about immigration. He was talking about trade, and Sanders was talking about equality. Hillary Clinton wasn't talking about that many issues, but, but, but she was talking about experience, so she's never talked about that many issues. But the primary campaign was great. I, as far as Sanders and equality, excellent stuff, and also TPP, I think the campaign greatly simplified global trade. Global trade can be very, very good in some cases. It's not, it's, it's primarily good, but it's not been good for manufacturing. But in this campaign, the general election campaign has been all about so-called character or lack thereof and credibility and all of those things. So I think that it's, it's actually probably worse than the campaign that was the zenith of negativity, which is the 1988 Bush-Dukakis campaign, which had the famous racially tinged, racially prejudiced Willie Horton ad. This is probably more negative. And the question is, where do we go from here? How do we try to make some sense of afterwards? How do we try to recoup? Boxing match is a good metaphor. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like the whole thing, too, started with, and, and I feel like this was just like the genesis of it all, was when Donald Trump came up on stage with the finger comment and talked about the size of you-know-what. I mean, I feel like it all kind of, like, that was where the snowball first got pushed down the mountain, very, very small, and it has just been rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling from there. And it's just sucking up everything that's around it, including Hillary Clinton herself, to run this negative campaign. And it's, you know, clearly it's working. I mean, that's, it's that simple. It was actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you about. What is the campaign that Hillary Clinton is running? Because we constantly hear about Donald Trump being up on stage. And what is it? I, there was a recent uh, story that came out. I forget where it was out of that was saying that Donald Trump has had over a billion dollars worth of advertising just by, you know, the local news or the, the news channels, national news channels covering him alone. And what campaign is Hillary Clinton even running at this point? I want to I wanna answer that, but I want to go to two things that you said before that which were very, very interesting. Donald Trump has been the instigator of this, but like all charismatic communicators, 
he could not instigate it without a willing group of followers to help bring it out of him. And so if you go back to that first debate with Megyn Kelly when he made that joke, uh, you know, you've, you've only said, she said, you know, you've said things terrible about women. He said, and he says, only Rosie O'Donnell. And then it got worse and worse. That debate there, actually, the crowd laughed at that. The crowd laughed, and his followers loved that stuff. So you've got a group, and this goes back to what we were talking about before, who feel it's really interesting. People say, oh, I think campaigns are so terrible. I would never talk about verbal aggression to my kids. But there they are. And the Clinton people we saw are not without some criticism. Uh, there they are, uh, enjoying that. So he's got an audience. The other group that, that has made this possible is the news media. The news media, primarily cable television, but all of them on the left, MSNBC, uh, in the middle, CNN, on the more right, uh, Fox, have all covered this. And you're right, the, the statistics about 55 million or so dollars of, of free advertising, if you convert the amount of time that would have been covered had it been paid for by advertising. The Shorenson study found that at, um, at Harvard. We did a study with my, some of my, my students did this with uh, Arbella Capic and Alex Greenwald and Logan, uh, Logan SQ and, and uh, Katrina Tomp. We did a study we we're going to present at Midwest Association of Public Opinion Research, and we found Trump got the lion's share of coverage. And, and, there was, and, and much of what he said was not newsworthy. But that's another factor that legitimated it. So all of these factors have occurred, and they're all part of the kind of, there's a trifecta of Trump, followers, and media that have created this. I, uh, there's not a conspiracy, but that's what's happened. What, is, what kind of campaign is Hillary Clinton want, running? And it has been, it's not been, she has said some statements. She has a platform. Uh, she does a platform. And some, some, of, some of it is that the media don't cover it. That's true. But what she has spent the bulk of her time doing has been excoriating and condemning Donald Trump for his temperament. <laughs> and, and so I guess if you're Hillary, in Hillary Clinton's position, you're thinking to yourself that if he's getting all this coverage, you need to get some coverage too. And you, know, you get some support of Saturday Night Live comments. So her campaign has been primarily negative. She, she stands for some things. And I think where she is effective is on social issues. She's effective among her followers, but, but her, she, has been, she has decided that the best way to win is by scaring people about Donald Trump rather than trying to show why she's effective. There's a, there's a, a political scientist found out a la this, that, that you're allowed about 14 years in the public sector before, can, before you really run dry. And Hillary, the, the is, a candidate is, can be in there about 14 years, and after that they're so well known, and they take so many positions that are going to alienate some group that they're just not going to do well. And her problem is that she's been, gosh, if you want to, let, let's even, if you, even to be charitable, it's 24 years from, ni from 92, but if you want to go back to the 80s, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's three decades. So this is, she has much baggage, many perceptions, and these are, these stick to her. So do you think it's like, to, to go closer to my realm that I know well, do you think it's kind of like the, uh, there's always this theory in the NFL, where if a head coach is in for too long, he just becomes white noise. Do you think that's something that's kind of happening with Hillary, that it's just almost becoming white noise and we're just so sick and tired of her, that it's really hurting her, or... Well, I think a lot of people. I think a lot of people are tired of her. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think a lot of people are tired. I think there is a, always a search for something new, and I think that she, for some voters, some voters I think it's sexist. Some voters I think she has a manner and a disingenuousness that they find difficult. But you know, you have to remember that 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 there are a lot of voters in the Democratic Party who supported her, too. And, and she wouldn't have gotten where she did if she hadn't gotten all these votes. So uh, when you say we're tired of her, I, I think that needs to be context that needs to be put, toned down a little bit. I mean, I know you're, you're talking about it in general, and that's true. But yeah. she, I mean, and you're trying to explain, and I, and I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. You're trying to explain the negativity. I think that's part of it. And I think part of it is, um, some of it's sexist, some of it is, she has said things over the years, and she's gotten herself into troubles where it doesn't seem like she's ever telling the truth. She's very calculating. I think that's true. What she has had trouble doing 
is channeling some of the compassion she has. Uh, I mean, this is not to say that she is, uh, as she said in the Al Smith, that she's saintly. She is not. It's to say that she has not been able to persuade voters that she really cares about them, and she's not been able to show them that she really is a compassionate candidate. And so that's the challenge she's faced. And because of that, I think she's, she's gone back to what's worked for her, which has been negative to Trump. And I think it's been very effective. And he, of course, has enabled it too. There were many times, there were several times in the campaign, Dan, when, when he could have probably changed the tide. Yeah. Had he been presidential, a la Reagan Carter in, in 1980 in the first debate, had he not assaulted 10 women, which now up to 10, <laughs> had he not made that outrageous comment on, on, on uh, Access Hollywood, had he, been, had, you know, had he admitted to mistakes, you know, that's always difficult in politics, but it would have been better, he might have been able to change the tide because the fact that she, Hillary Clinton, who's been in office, who at one point was one of the most popular admired women of the world, was struggling with Donald Trump, uh, tells you that you know there could have been times. But he, he has shown himself to be a very, very uh, toxic campaigner, a campaigner who does appeal to people, who does raise issues that speak to people and who feel marginalized, and I think that's, that's good. But he has shown himself to be a campaigner who cannot unify his party. It's really interesting what you said, just even on the basis of, and, and it's really smart, even from a political campaign, I think one of the best things that could have happened to him is if he would have said something like that and then came out and went, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I'm a rookie at this, I'm an outsider, you know, it, it, I'm going to make mistakes, but you know what, I'm going to stand up to him and I'm going to stand behind him. And I feel like if he would have even came out and said that once, like, I think it would have done wonders for his campaign. It's a great point. You know, we talk about that in persuasion as far as inoculation. Well, Hillary Clinton will say, uh, you know, I'm not a natural campaigner, but uh, these, are, these are very effective ways of inoculating yourself. And then, and then once you've inoculated yourself, then you, can, then you can encourage people to be on your side. He could have said that he has trouble doing anything but attack and be defensive and be insecure and be very much about Donald Trump's uh, ego. But absolutely, if you'd said, you know, folks, I, I, I made a mistake. I'm not like these natural politicians. I'm still learning, and I want to go out there and learn to do better so I can serve you. Uh, people would like that up to a point, and, and yet he did not know. He did not, he, you know, you can't admit, you know, he, when, when you do what, what appears to be horrific things to him, and you can't just say, well, I made a mistake. But, but that, that's not going to wash. And, but, but on the other hand, you're right. And there, he has shown some of his true colors. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, that, it's, it's, that he's all bad and she's all good. That's simply not true. We're just trying to understand some of the darker sides of this campaign. Right, exactly. Now, one of the, the weird things as well is I was sitting there watching the debate. Um, I was just thinking about this. I feel like what's ended up happening with this campaign, and it could be due to the negativity, it could be due to, you know, Lord knows what, but... I feel like almost the fact that Hillary Clinton has the potential to become the first female president has become like completely slept under the rug, and we're not even treating her as if she is the first female candidate that is running for president. Instead, we're treating it like it's, or I should say that has made it this far and become a major party nomination for the presidency. I feel like it's just kind of like swept under the rug, like it's the secondary issue, or actually even in this campaign, we're like 25th issue down the line compared to so many other things. Do you feel the same way with that? I do, I do. I think that's a good point. I think, I think that, um, that some of that is, in a way, good in the sense that people are comfortable with it and they don't have to say, oh my goodness, this is really something I've got to think about it. I think there are at least two reasons for why that's happened. One is because of Trump. He takes the oxygen out. You'll see that in any story after the debate, after she says it, it's all about Trump. Uh, he made this statement, and we'll know that on November 9th, when he when he litigates, Hillary Clinton, if the polls are right, is going to be elected. But the story is going to be Donald Trump challenges it. It's the same thing. It's it's a gift, but it's kind of a sad gift. It's kind of a narcissistic and a very very unpleasant gift he has for making himself the center of things. That's not. It's a gift, but it's actually a very very dysfunctional gift. That's part of it. The other reason is that there are a lot of millennial millennials and young people, especially young women who are not blown away by the fact that she's the first woman, who find her an unsatisfactory spokesperson, who are tired of her, one of somebody else, one of somebody who seemed to, to fit uh, a different kind of more authentic. I mean, I think, I think young people as a group look for authenticity. 
Uh, I think that's something that's great about being young. I think we all look for authenticity, but I think probably being young, you look for something that's more authentic because you're looking for something that is, uh, you know, you, you think that the world is, is pure and you look for things that are, and I, and I think that's good. We, if you don't look for things that are pure, then you don't make change because if you're so well, that's the way the world is. So there's good in that too. But, but the search for authenticity led to Sanders and it led for, it was to an understandable frustration to somebody who is extraordinarily inauthentic. That's Clinton, at least on the on the public stage. On the public right. stage, I mean, I'm sure she's a very authentic grandmother. But <laughs> right. <laughs> but, 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 okay. So that factor and Trump's ability to suck the oxygen out have meant that we've we've not called attention to her her being the first female uh, president. And I think that's a you know, I think that I think in the end that's going to cause a lot of women voters who are on the borderline to really say, my heart is with her. Right. And that actually be a really good ad. I think I, I'm sure they've thought about it to try to think. I really don't like Hillary. I, I don't trust her, but but she she's she could make history, and then that could be a way of accessing the the f sense of history that people that, women, that young women feel. That's I mean that's beyond interesting. I mean that there's so much stuff just to even dissect in that whole statement. You <laughs> this whole thing is this whole campaign is just amazing, and it. And it it's so funny because we do, we continue to come back to this, the Saturday Night Live Kate McKinnon's impression of her, which is so good at just showing how borderline robotic she is, that when she opens her mouth, it really does feel like a think tank is coming out of her, that this is not my opinion, this is not my feeling on it, this is the feeling of my 10 advisors who told me to say this, and now I will say it to you verbatim. You know, it's it's almost like running a parrot. That's a really, really, that, that's exactly the way she comes across. And that's the way a lot of younger people feel that way, that, that she's just, that it's been scripted and test marketed. I think that when she spoke at the, I think that that is something that all politicians do, by the way. You see Obama mm -hmm. parse his words, you saw Romney do it. You have to do it, because if you don't do it, then, you'll, then, then it'll be held against you. I think she's just not a natural, emotive politician. That may doesn't necessarily mean she'll be a bad president, but but it does suggest that in this domain, she's a little limited, and and, and I think that's fair. I think that it's been a very very bad campaign as far as sexism, as far as the stuff that we've heard Trump do. It's just it's just it's pretty pretty discouraging, as far as that's what we. It's been a very bad campaign. I think that the the trade stuff early on was good. I think the the primary campaign was good, but this campaign. Uh, just looking at it more broadly, has been very negative. And I, I mean, not negative in the sense that we're, the, the good stuff of negative. Have we ever seen an election that's like this? I mean... No, we have We haven't seen, well, we, I mean, yeah, we have. You, you can go back, go back to the 1800s. You, certainly, you can have, you, you see the, uh, the, uh, the adult, there was the ABC of Andrew Jackson, the adulterer, the boar, something like that, and the cuckolder. There were those things that he, when he was supposedly married, uh, when, when Rachel Jackson had divorced, had supposedly divorced her, her husband, and he married her uh, without kind of papers. All those things have happened. Um, we've had Grover Cleveland, we've had rotten things said about Andrew, about, about Thomas Jefferson with the Sally Hemings when, uh, when he apparently did. Uh, father or child with Sally Hemings if the DNA stuff is to be believed and many researchers think it is. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can go back and we, we, we certainly, but I think that the difference between those campaigns and this campaign was that it was milder um, and also it wasn't, it didn't have the vivid uh, digital uh, audio uh, and it didn't have the reach and it didn't have as much sex and tawdriness. No, I think it's it's a, and also there wasn't as much venom between both candidates. Yeah. And you saw that at Al Smith. So I mean I think I think you know I think the the the, the it is the campaign is as it was it is and I think that's why what's so discouraging. I can live with the negativity. I can live with that. That's 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 part of politics. I can live with the attacks. I mean the, the sexual predator stuff is unacceptable in any moral universe. But I can live with with all the attacks. What I can't live with is a candidate saying he will not abide by the election and he'll keep us in suspense. That is untenable. And you've heard everybody say that, not everybody, you've, had, you've heard a number of people say that on, on both sides of the aisle. 
And that's where we started. And I think that what, what will, it will be up to the next president, and it looks like it'll be Hillary Clinton, but, but he's going to try to litigate it, uh, to bring people together. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, the whole thing is just still, I'm, I'm living in the middle of it, and I constantly think to myself, like, what's going to happen, you know, 25, 30 years from now when I'm bouncing my grandchildren on my knee, and they look at me and go, you know. Well, you won't have grandchildren in 30 well, years. Well, where they're looking at me and going, like, you know, Grandpa, what was it like being in the middle of the Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, you know, feet, you know, <laughs> campaign? And I'm going to look at him and go, well, kids, you know, if professional wrestling is still around, it's very similar to that. <laughs> well, I, I, well actually, 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 you'll give my perspective because, hey, they're going to say their campaign. Can you believe what they're saying now? <laughs> and, you know, and like stuff will be coming into their ears and their watch and everything. You say, and you're going to say, say, and you're going to say, hey, hey, was, oh, no, it couldn't have been as bad. It couldn't have been as bad. So, no, but I think there's very little salutary about the campaign. Uh, it sounds to me like you're fairly negative on the campaign as far as your evaluation. I mean, I feel like I'm I'm sitting in the middle of a, and I, I consistently come back to this, I feel like I'm sitting in the middle of a professional wrestling storyline. Like, this feels like something that we would have seen between Rowdy Roddy Piper running for president against Hulk Hogan. And the two of them would have been muckraking and throwing mud at each other like this the entire time. The only difference is that, you know, there's no fighting in the middle of a ring between two candidates. It just, it feels like I'm Every day, there's this great sports writer named Bill Simmons who always talked about this thing called the sports, Tyson Zone. Sports Illustrated? Uh, ESPN, now with, the, now with the ringer. But he always used to talk about the Tyson Zone. And he talked about this idea that Mike Tyson had hit a point in the 90s where you could wake up and pick up the paper and read anything and you would totally believe it. And I feel like Donald Trump is right there. I could wake up tomorrow, pick up the paper and open it up, and it could say Donald Trump moons crowd of 500,000 supporters. And I would have went, yep, that happened. <laughs> and I wouldn't have even thought about it for a quarter of a second. I wouldn't even had to fact check it. I would have been like, yep, that happened. Let's move on. The question I also have is, is this whole sexual scandal that took place with him, is this finally broken the Teflon that seems to have enveloped him throughout this campaign? Or is he still Teflon? Well... Well, let me answer that, and let me try to close on a positive note. Um, a la what you were saying about the ringer and professional wrestling. Um, it, it is Teflon among his supporters. Yes, he, they, 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 they just, they're not, they're not disregarding it. They don't like it. I mean, there's a, there's a level of nuance among most of his supporters. They don't like it. And, and, and they, they find it very disturbing, but they hate Hillary Clinton so much, which is interesting and worthy of pers pursuing and understanding. They hate her so much, and they're so concerned with issues that they don't think anybody but he champions that they're willing to forgive it. So, and also, he, he has a Teflon public where it doesn't seem to bother him at all. It has hurt him drastically in Pennsylvania. With the suburban vo women voters, he was down by 43% in suburban Pennsylvania, suburban Philadelphia. So it has definitely hurt him. I think, I think some of the scab started to come off after those comments that he made with Billy Bush. I think that's when some of it came off, and I think he lost some credibility there. Um, but you know, Reagan had a Teflon too, uh, that he could, he could say anything about Iran-Contra, things like that, and he got away with it until at some point it became untenable. And I think we've reached a little bit of that with Trump. I will say that I think your analogies are all correct. I think you're, you're getting, in, in even your, your id Freud thing is really captures an emotional truth. Absolutely. I do think that there are some salutary features of the campaign. One is that, that there has been a renewed attention to the sexual assault issue. I think also there's a renewed respect for some of the norms of democracy among many people. I think that we also have had a very, very honest discussion of trade and immigration. And I think, although I don't know that I'd like to have TPP walk back, it is going to be, I think that those are all positive things. It has, this is more complicated, it's brought out the alt-right, the, the out of the woodwork, you know. The whole Breitbart, <laughs> you know, the, the Breitbart crowd. Breitbart, Breitbart crowd, right, right. It, it's brought them out. That's more nuanced because on the one hand, it's good that people are channeling their anger and not doing it in violent ways, and they're talking, and that's always good. It's disturbing because they're talking, and they're yelling, and they're <laughs> saying these things. So, I mean, I've argued actually that we need to have different, we have, need to have 
more party, we have need to have more representation, different ways of electing our officials so that we get more votes in. But this, this kind of scares you. But, you know, the, the, the ultimate statement of I was Brandeis or John Stuart Mill is that the answer to democracy is more democracy. Uh -huh. The answer to the problems of democracy are more democracy. And I think that's really what the, the shot is. We've headed out there. It's open. It, pe people have gotten used to it. I think it's now the job of the new president to harness that and to bring it together and get something done in 100 days. So just a quick closing question. What is the future of campaigns after this? What effect is this going to have on the future, Well, in, in your opinion? Well, the, the campaign for the presidency of 2020 will start on November 9th. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! And then officially it'll start around you know eighteen. I I think that's a very interesting question. I think that it will depend on whether or not we have a new party. The, the Republican Party has schismed a little bit. If we have a group of Republicans who are now given institutional and mediated weight, like the the Breitbart, if they have if they become a force in politics, I think you'll see more of this. I do think there'll be more permissive permissiveness for saying these things. I think that this probably will be an aberration, but I think that you'll see more loud voices, more anger. Uh, I, I, I don't think that, I think that we'll find the next campaign, you're always fighting the, the war you lost, therefore the next campaign will not be like this. But there'll be pockets in which it's more acceptable. And so, has it changed campaigning? Yes, it probably has. It's made, it's made for more tweets. It's made for people feeling they can say what they want. Uh, I think it's allowed, the, it's given the news media license to cover things that are absolutely in no journalistic universe, which is sound, uh, uh, free reign to do that. But it also may have scared people away, and depending on what the outcome is. Now, if he loses badly, then, you know, the fire will hurt and they'll be, they'll be clear of it. So I think, I think those, are all, those are all possibilities. Those have to be sorted out. But you know, this is the politics ain't beanbag, and now it ain't even football. It's much worse. Yeah. Um, I got one last thing for you, and this just popped into my head because I was talking with a buddy of mine about it. Do you, do you still have time, or do yeah, you need last to go? thing, last thing. Okay. This now this is a doozy, so I'm forewarning you. If we got to postpone and do it a different time, mm -hmm. I understand. I'll do my best. Are you in? I I've been recently noticing more and more that the ideals of a conservative and a liberal have basically turned into just these separate boxes that you've come to just check. So now, you know, the idea of being a Republican or a conservative, the idea has now become, are you, you know, pro-faith, pro-abortion, pro-gun? In those, you know, it's basically those three boxes, and the liberal, is, you know, agenda is the other direction of that. Is that still the case, or do you still think we have the fundamental idea that a conservative is for lesser government, it's for you know, lesser taxes, where a liberal is for more government control, you know, a little bit more taxes, that kind of stuff. Well, you put your finger on the symbols. The symbols are faith and guns and, and then Hillary Care and things like that. Those are the symbols. And the symbols have been very, very powerful. That's why so many people are supporting Trump, even though he has a, you've got a lot, you've got conservative support, even though his stand on Russia and Israel are weaker. Than, and, and more dovish. That makes no sense. They're, they're supporting Trump even though he would repose orthodoxy on free trade, if you're a conservative. So the symbols have been very, very powerful. Uh, philosophically, the, part, the philosophies are still there. I mean, liberalism and conservatism has kind of broken down because it's so nuanced and it's so issue-based. Yes, there are some differences between a conservative and a, and a liberal in terms of uh, trust in government, uh, social programs, sure, but I think I think the, and I, I do think that I don't think those have changed. I think if you look at a strong conservative like a George Will, he's outraged by this campaign. So no, I don't I, I don't think we should lose sight. I think some of your questions are suggesting, and they're good questions, that sort of the the floor is is has has sort of been taken from with, from but beneath us, and we're going down down to kind of the abyss. I think the values are still there, Americans. Are still want a president who is not a lecturer. They want a president who stands for things, and conservatism still stands for smaller government, for for smaller taxes, for uh, global trade. The question is whether or not there is a any kind of 
conservatism, any kind of conservative movement anymore. I think it's on the political level that we're seeing. Philosophically, things haven't changed, but politically, I think the ground has moved. Dr. Perloff, thank you. Thank you, sir. This was a blast. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. it. I enjoyed it. Once again, thank you to Dr. Perloff for doing that interview, and thank you for listening to the Cleveland Stater podcast. We will be back later in the week with one of our writers at the Cleveland Stater here with another pod. So thank you for listening, and you can pick up our brand new issue on newsstands all around campus and at theclevelandstater.com. That once again is clevelandstater.com. Thanks for listening.